this episode, we have a lovely guest called PJ Weary, who is the host of the podcast Chasing Leviathan, on which I have been a guest. And so he has been invited uh, to the Flat Workshop podcast to talk about writing, SEO, digital marketing, all sorts of wonderful things. However, because the conversation was so rich and full of wonderful bits of advice and thoughts and feelings, we had to split it into two. So this first episode that you're hearing now is going to be about the creative side of things, mostly to do with writing. And the bonus episode following shortly will be about the digital content and SEO and marketing and things like that. So you can choose which one you're interested in. And of course, if you just want to hear this just fantastic conversation, you can listen to both. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you will forgive me for how long it took to come out. It has been an unexpectedly busy week. But enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Flawed Workshop podcast with me, your host, Nancy Art Music. And me, your co-host, Alex Roberts. Today, we're here with... PJ Weary from Candid Goat. Woo! Woo! Uh, <laughs> PJ, excited to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on here. Um, for those of you uh, who are listening that have been listening for a while uh, that um, might know a little bit about the podcast schedule, this is the first one back after a little while. Um, so it might get a little bit weird at some point. Um PJ has been warned about this, and um, we're just going to see where... Yeah, they warned me not to be too weird, but they know they can only... Yeah, it's, it's my fault. If anything goes wrong in this episode, you know it's not Nancy or Alex, so... <laughs> I think some of our audience members will know that that's... You're being too nice already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us uh, your origin story, sort of who you are and how you uh, became creative in which case for you, I mean, sort of with the podcast and kind of going into SEO and marketing, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we did talk about, I'm also working on writing. Um, I have written a novel that will not see the light of day first draft. That was pretty ugly. Which and I'm working on a second one, which I think will do much better. <laughs> we'll do much better, <laughs> but uh, the business has kind of taken off and uh, the podcast, you know, getting that underway has been some work, but um so I uh, just grew up loving reading. Um, uh, one of like kind of like those family lore kind of situations where my mom clipped out. Uh, I was three years old, I think, and the n- local newspaper took a picture of my mom and I, uh, and she was reading a book to me, and she like turned the page, and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> For that, an excited face. Some of you, <laughs> I, I just realized they're not going to see the video. They're just like, <laughs> it wasn't like I was horrified or like being tortured to read. I was enjoying it. So um, <laughs> loved, loved reading. Um, and so it's kind of pushed me in two directions. I grew up uh, fundamentalist Christian through my high school years, worked out of that. But that led to some interesting questions because their views of art especially were very contradictory because they didn't see much value in it. And so they didn't think about it a lot. And I loved books and I loved reading. So uh, I would ask questions and they'd be like, well, you shouldn't read today's stuff. It has too much, you know, trash and objectionable elements in it. And I'm like, you should be reading things like Shakespeare. And I was like, oh, okay. Or Plato. And so I went and I read Shakespeare. Read Romeo and Juliet. It is a it is a teen murder suicide. <laughs> it's not a. It's... Oh no! I mean, even just the the it, I read him in um, No Fear Shakespeare, and like the modern translations of the puns he was using, I was like, <laughs> this is this is way worse than anything. Like, what is going on? And then you read the history of it, and you realize that at the time that was the lowbrow. People were like, how dare he write things like that on stage? And then, so there was all sorts of, I mean, obviously I've moved away from that. I still consider myself a devout Christian, but much more balanced. Um, (laughs) And so (laughs) the, like, there was just all sorts of odd things that came out of that. So that led to two things. One is I I love uh, reading. I love writing. And that's always been kind of a primary love for me. And then uh, that led me into philosophy. Um, primarily to figure out how does fiction actually work because it led to all sorts of questions for me i'm like because you you can go the other way like um we we definitely run into like okay uh my kid is walking out in public and you're wearing a t-shirt with like stuff on it i don't want my kid to see you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it's kind of like yeah like i mean you know like if you 
anyways, I don't, I don't need to get into all that. Like, you know, you, you talk like, obviously that we have like consent forms on certain websites for certain reasons, right? Like yeah. we understand like there's a reason and like, why, why do we do this? Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's not just, uh, like, oh, everyone should just be able to express everything all the time. Right. Like I, we, we have specific beaches that are nude for a reason. So, yeah. um, <laughs> It's nice not just to, like to have the option to be like, do I do I want to see this? And <laughs> I thought they were just there to make me feel bad. Or bad. <laughs> Sometimes better. <laughs> so, anyways, you understand. I, I mean, it led to all sorts of questions. Like, um, one of the biggest ones that's really influenced me is like, how does truth work in art? Because I do believe that art mm. can communicate truth. Um, but even going back to Plato, which I was reading at the time, like he's like, art is just lying. Mm -hmm. And then I, I always love, uh, Oscar Wilde's always been one of my favorite authors. And, um, I love his response to that was like, yes. And we're really good liars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he lent into it fully. I, yeah. Just like that. I mean, that's totally Oscar Wilde, but I just look at that and, um, I, I think there's better answers than that, but I think that's a good, like, I think that's a clever one from Oscar Wilde. So I always bring it up. So that's kind of what led me into philosophy. I had my own, you know, you, I think on here, you, when we talked about what you want to talk about, uh, what's a bad day look like for me. So yeah. I, uh, I had some, uh, I've always struggled with depression, even when I was a younger kid. And mm -hmm. then I developed some dietary stuff, but I didn't know it because it didn't show up in the normal ways. It literally just made me feel like I was very tired and very kind of achy sick. Like there were no other symptoms. Okay. And um, I don't know what it is exactly even now. I know that it's connected to some forms of dairy. Some forms of dairy I can have. Some I can't. I don't know what it is. So like, it's just like, like whatever. Like I'm just like. <laughs> to, go to like go uh, unnecessarily add to like, oh my God, me too. Because <laughs> I feel like whenever you tell someone a health like issue or something that you're going through, they're like, oh my God, my aunt or like I tried this yeah. tea. And it's like, okay, fine. But I, <laughs> I'm kind of going through something similar. I'm trying to figure out what it is. And on this, like, I saw that a pharmacy near us did like tests. And when I, when, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> when I went in there to inquire about these tests, all I wanted was a yes or no answer and a price maybe to see how much they would be this li like I started saying like oh like you know I have these and these foods and this is how they affect me and she goes oh no oh. <laughs> I was like um this is a weird reaction <laughs> okay so I was like so just like is this something that these tests I saw that you do these tests online could these tests accommodate this sort of thing or help me figure out what it is she's like yeah I have trouble with bread do you and I was like I don't I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I, 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 have tr I have trouble with you. <laughs> I just, just want to know about the test. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of why. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you want friendly, uh, cut like salespeople and customer like represented people, but then sometimes it's like, I just met you thirty seconds ago. I just. I just want the thing. Can we just like, like yeah. can we keep this like professional? Yeah. And health stuff is already intimate as it is. It doesn't need oh, to. Yeah. I don't need to know. Well, this isn't a, like <laughs> back and forth kind of thing. You don't need to tell me about your bread issues. I, I mean, Let me diagnose you. <laughs> yeah. Like. I mean, having worked in pharmacies and as a nurse previously, like just yeah. talking about bread as a dietary thing is like the tip of the ice. It's like a snowflake on the edge of an iceberg. Like you don't even. <laughs> Blue, some of the things people will start talking to you about that you've only just met. And you have <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Anyway, digressed. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I was talking about the, the food thing because yeah. I was talking about, I was, my goal was to, because you can always, and I, I would, I'm not saying this to demean it. I think it's part of how our culture works. You can always write novels on the side for the most part. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so, I could have gone full time into that. I wanted to have kids, so I wanted a more stable source of income. So the idea was to go and become a teacher. But right when I was supposed to be applying for PhD, um, is around like twenty four. That's often when uh, your body often switches in terms of allergies and stuff. People develop a lot of new allergies, and so I all of a sudden just got really sick. And I like I was supposed to be reading like three thousand pages in primary sources of Heidegger, mm -hmm. and write a thirty page paper on it. Um, along with some other classes and uh i m i was not up to it so i ended up finishing the paper i wrote 17 pages in one day which can tell man it was an amazing paper i can tell you 
at 17 pages in one day. As, um, as somebody who was supposed to write 10,000 words in one night and only came out with 4,000 extremely mediocre words. Um, <laughs> and how many, of the, how many of those words were and? Like it's <laughs> and the and and the. Um, also, hey, like, don't judge, don't judge the word buffer, <laughs> like padding. So, like really weird ones popped out, like subsequently, and I just, oh, it was really weird. I just, I don't. Therefore, know. Yeah. therefore, ooh, that's ergo. Ergo. Uh, <laughs> I should have used that one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I was going to go and get my PhD, and this is me explaining how I became a digital marketer. Uh, I was going to go get my PhD in philosophy, and that didn't happen. Um, so then I had a master's in philosophy of religion, uh, also known as unemployable. Um, so I, I went around and looked at, it's alternative. yeah, alternatively employable. Yes. Alter- um, <laughs> now this is marketing. This is the, the yeah, kind of exactly. I, I, work, I work in PR as my day job, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's exactly. Yes. Um, so uh, it is funny. Like I would not trade it for the world. I learned so much and it's just better for my life. Like you learn a lot through philosophy and moving directly into business. Um, I immediately found that it helped me a lot because I've, w- I've been trained to break down problems mm-hmm. and I've been trained to do cultural criticism, which when you talk about marketing, marketing is just like an easier version of cultural criticism. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, well, pretty sure that this is what they want you know what I mean? like you can think about it from the other person's perspective so i uh, went to and tried to be a teacher uh it was not my high school I, I think i had taught at the college level uh i had guest lectured for professors and i loved it i loved coming up with my own stuff because that's what you're supposed to do right you're supposed to teach twice a week and you're coming up with your own lectures and then you hone those lectures you turn them into books i love that high school you're supposed to use other people's stuff and the main thing that they want from you is classroom management Mm-hmm. And I am terrible at classroom management. You're, hey, your class is not challenging enough. Your class is too challenging. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, like whatever. I, it wasn't, it, I, I, the people, everyone I know who is a successful, successful teacher mm-hmm. was pretty much the opposite of me. They loved the grind of it. They loved showing up with the kids and they just have tons of energy. And, and I, I do well talking to people, but I recharge by being by myself, mm-hmm. which it does not work well when you're teaching because you're not by yourself. No. So no. I, w- I would just be exhausted every day. It just didn't work. And that was, that was actually great. Um, the, I was teaching at a private school. They lost, um, and this was a low point for me because I was like, I can't provide for my family, which is a tough thing as, as a man, you know, I had, um, I, I ended up getting let go because they lost 60 students at like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars a pop. And I it was my first year teaching there. So you're like, how many teacher salaries? And I am the last one who got hired. Okay, that was easy. All right. <laughs> and I'm gone. Last and it was one great. in, first one out. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it and honestly it was it was great because I did not belong there. And I, it it totally I clearly see that as like God's hand on my life, like moving me a certain direction. Like, okay. Yeah, it's like it's time. Um, it's really nice. I think yeah. what I've found out as I'm uh, as I'm kind of navigating mm. through life and and getting more years under my belt, uh, I feel so happy saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I'm 27 now, you know. <laughs> but it's I I'm finding out that like a lot of growing up is mm. uh, finding out what you don't like definitely in yes. uh, and. Mm just really even if other people feel like that's the way that's what you should like confidently yeah. just saying no i've tried it i hated it for these reasons i won't do it again it's a waste of my time i want yeah. to enjoy as much of my life as possible and do that with the things that i actually like instead of trying to continue to like the things that i know i will never like right absolutely Something. especially holding yourself to stockholm syndrome like forcing yourself to like something. Yeah. Eventually, I'll be friends with it. Ooh. Like, it's like yeah. it's not healthy. That's not right. Sorry, you've you've just yeah. like is it pers- personification? You've personified something. So yes. in like in my head now, the stuff I don't like has cute, gigantic like cartoon eyes, and it's like, please like me. And I'm like, <laughs> what you can't see? Okay. What, what you can't see is the knife it's holding behind it. Yeah. Yeah, but I can't see it. It's not a problem yet. Just because you can't it's see behind it. the eyes, the giant cartoon <laughs> eyes. <laughs> oh my god! It knows too well my weakness. Oh, 
<laughs> no, no, I absolutely. And I think part of it is understanding, especially like the world's changing so fast with the internet. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to pick up. There were only so many paths in a lot of ways and you still had different paths too. But uh, with the internet, there's so many different ways to do things. You're not, you don't have to follow a traditional path. Mm-hmm. And there's also a use of language that gets confusing there because I love to teach, mm-hmm. but I'm not a good teacher per se in the way that it's used today. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I feel like when I, when I lecture, when I, when I mm. talk, I like, I can communicate content effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, that, that serves me well in what I do now, mm-hmm. but, uh, but actually what a teacher does which is it has the same word in it. So it sounds like the same thing in terms of like classroom management. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, that's a different thing. Yeah. Even like what a, what a kindergarten teacher does compared to a, I mean, I taught sixth grade and I was not prepared. I was really? like, I could not. I was like, that's not a, it's not a great age to be thrown in at, is it? I mean, there's hormones <laughs> all over the place that things are changing. Like, yeah. Friendships, yeah. uh, friendships are dissolving in front of you. Like you don't know what's going. Like half the words. Then reforming thing. the next day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, like I mean, that's in at the deep end. That sounds know? terrifying. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I, th- I was li- literally just uh, thinking the way you explain teaching. Like, there's something to be said about the presenting information correctly. Like things can be said to. I I know. I did not enjoy uh, doing maths and science when I was at school, but I distinctly remember the best of my maths and science teachers, like the, me understanding because of the way they explained things to me and being right. like, this is incredible. Like, why, why isn't there like option A, B and C? And then you can pick one about how you want things explained mm-hmm. to you or something like that. But it makes so much sense that you've uh, basically like you've now got this podcast and it's so interesting. I was a guest. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Oh, loved it. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, just the things that we discussed, it was so interesting to like, I remember having conversations like that when I was at school about the, the concept of like little things in physics that I could unfortunately never use formulas and equations to um like basically say to an examiner that I knew, but I could talk about and explain string theory all day. It was really fun. I don't remember anything about it now. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I yeah. once had a physics test paper and it was uh, a formula for working out uh, we had to work out something like terminal velocity along with, um, but as it's moving sideways as well and all that sort of, so it's like moving at angles and things. And the the maths part was always my, my weak point. And I remember, because it was only a test exam, like I just put, I just put in, depends on how close the floor is for terminal velocity. <laughs> Did you get any points for that? No, I, rem- I remember a smiley face saying very good. Yes. And zero points. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's, Yes, at least the teacher had a sense of humor. Yeah, no. It's really um, weird in the UK. I feel like they have senses of humor about a lot of weird stuff like this that would just like I would get a see me. So, anyways, I you know I was mentioning. So I'm I'm getting to the digital marketing side of things. So at this point, we don't have any money. Thank you so um, much for keeping weird. us on track. By the way, no, no, all good, all good. Um, <laughs> that, but we have no money, and um, I'm still figuring out why. Uh, I still wasn't sure what was happening because I didn't have any of like the normal, like normally if you're struggling with dairy, you have like very obvious bathroom symptoms and I didn't have those. I mm-hmm. just felt tired and I was like, oh, I must just be getting old. <laughs> and then we made it. I was like, I was like, that was really fast. Like <laughs> there's, there's two options. It, it's old or Lyme disease. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was like, is there, do we have mold in the house? Not everyone else is feeling this way. I'm like, I remember having energy. And then we switched. uh, I I was like, I just need to do something drastic. And so I tried a a really kind of drastic diet. And um, I literally, my wife, you know, like a lot of times you switch diets, people don't feel well the first couple of days. My wife was like, oh, and I was bouncing up and down, literally bouncing up and down in the kitchen. I'm like, this is so strange. Awesome. What happened? And so, I mean, and that's like a, you know, a wonderful story to tell because like, it's like such an immediate reaction, you know, it wasn't like years. And anyways, so uh, I looked around and we had moved eight times in six years at that point. 
Whoa. six years of marriage. Yeah. Wow. Trying to make it work financially for different reasons. And I was like, I don't want to move anymore. <laughs> and so we we're and all the job opportunities I was looking at were going to be uh, out of state. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was like, in, in terms of what I would want to do with like philosophy of religion. So I was looking at churches or I was looking at schools, right? Like, I mean, it's kind of like, you're not going <laughs> to, what else good. are you going to do with that, right? Sunday school, um, best of both. Is yes, that- exactly. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so what ended up happening is I was like, well, I used to code when I was 16 and our computer crashed and my dad blamed it on the coding, but it actually wasn't because uh, <laughs> I actually know because it was... Uh, it was learner's basic. It wasn't even basic, the language. It was like a language like you can't touch the memory, so you can't break anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, But my dad didn't understand that. He's just like, you were coding and the computer crashed. And so then, like, and then I just got kind of bored of it. I was 16. Like, yeah. Whatever. He was and like, so, I saw the matrix on the computer and now it doesn't work anymore. So this is it. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I went. Uh, so at first, uh, my brother-in-law was in tech. I'd worked help desk in college. And I was just looking and saying, okay, where is there a lot of money and a lot of opportunity? Mm-hmm. Uh, where I don't have to spend another four years at school or even another year at school. And so I taught myself to program okay within six months. And um, I mean, that like I originally started looking at some other tech stuff. And then I was just like, I like the programming thing. And so I landed a job with a digital marketing agency and they were just starting out. It wasn't a good fit for me. They are very much like the grind mindset, which is great if that's what you're into. Um, I noticed that, you know, one of them had his wife stayed at home with the kids and my wife was working at the time. And then <laughs> and uh, the other one didn't have kids and he was, you know. Not he wasn't married or anything, and they were working like twelve hour days. H- having run my own business now, I know what they were doing. They were trying mm-hmm. to get it off the off the ground. Yeah. One, I didn't have the skills to do that. Like I had just started gotten started. They asked me to code in a language I'd never coded before. <laughs> so that went well, as you can guess. So yeah. they were just like, Oh, you can code. We don't have anyone who can code. And you're way cheaper than other programmers. I'm like, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> like, oh, do you speak French? C. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. That so, sounds good enough for me. <laughs> a- anyways, the uh, we we broke apart after about three months. It was fine. Like we, I think we both still have a good relationship. We don't like really keep in touch, but like when we like we, I see them. I have good thoughts. Like they're nice. They're nice guys. It was just Ooh. totally different culture. And so, literally, with like no money. Um, my wife uh, lost her job because the company got bought, and um, but she had a really good reference from her previous employer, and so uh, and that's why you know when we talk about creatives, it's not necessarily what we think of as creatives, but we work with keynote speakers. Mm-hmm. She came from okay. the corporate speaker industry, and so um, we just started our own agency. Be, uh, it, it was kind of by accident. We were like, I guess we'll freelance. I'm like, we have these skills. I'm not, I don't want to go get a corporate job. Um, I actually had an opportunity when I was learning to code uh, to take on a sales position selling roofs. And uh, the guy was making $150,000 a year. Oof. And I looked at my wife and I was like, yes, but he works 70 hours a week. And uh, I'll be honest. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to do that for, I could do that for two years and I won't make 70, I won't make 150,000 because I'm just getting started out. And I am going like, after two years, I'm like, I I don't want to talk about roofs anymore. Like, I'm just like, I don't care. (laughs) Like, I'm not Um, like, I have to be interested in what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah, Someone, someone will say something really innocent. Like, oh yeah, she's got a good roof over her head. And you'll be like, no, (laughs) (laughs) like, leave me alone. No. (laughs) So, uh, and I, unfortunately, I mean, so I like what I'm doing now better. Like, and I knew that I knew that I would enjoy, like, I just, uh, did a custom coding project for the first time in two years. Cause what we found out is when we started, like, I'll do a lot of like fixing code, but I don't just build stuff because people aren't willing to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So, um, people aren't willing to pay it, for anything. It's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's it, any time, anything mildly creative has a price tag on it people yeah. just lose their minds and don't understand um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, i mean when it comes to coding you, you are creating something from yeah, yeah, yeah. from basic ingredients it, it like something with function like too. something that, like yeah. you have to come up with it from nothing 
and yes. you've learned the skills for that. And they've got to pay you for the time, the skills, the effort you've put into it, and then the service you're providing. That comes with yeah. a price tag. Like, yes. Yeah. Have yeah. you seen that TikTok song? I think someone created it specifically for TikTok. It's like, why, you know, why does it cost so much? Because it takes me effing hours. Yeah. You know, like it's like this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. I love that song. I, I know. It's like, you know, it takes, if it takes 20 hours and not many other people can do it and you want it, it's going to be expensive. Like, and I love that, that, that it's taken off as a trend. Obviously, like, people like you and I are more likely to see it because we're in that sort of creative field. Right, right. And, but like, it's really funny in some ways to like, it's one of those things that you have to laugh at, otherwise you get really sad, where it's this fun song that's like really just, it, it's overlaid over literally hours of work. You see somebody, like there was one that I saw that was turning like rough turquoise into a, like a bit of jewelry as a pendant. It's the one I saw, yes. Oh my God, of course it takes hours. He took a rock out of the <laughs> ground and made it something pretty for you to wear. Like what? Yes, pay, pay. <laughs> However much it costs, I didn't check. I didn't look at the website. I wasn't interested in jewelry. I don't want it. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I don't want it, so I'm not going to pay. But, but if I, I did, <laughs> I would pay a fair price if I could afford it. Um, yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, so and all that to say, I mean, so one that explains... Uh, I know that was a lot of backstory, but I think it answers a couple of questions that you sent to me. And some of those questions are, uh, one, what does a bad day for me look like? Um, it's yeah, when I push myself too much to mm. the point where I don't, um, I stop following through on my habits. And a lot of times that includes eating poorly because yes. mo the way that I should eat takes time to make. And that's something I've enjoyed about this. Mm -hmm. uh, about working from home is that I can put on like I uh, something to cook downstairs for a couple hours and it's fine. Um, but if I'm just like, I'm just too tired and then I order in and then I don't feel well and then I feel more tired and then it just creates this weird and I, I'm just like, okay, like I get to, you know, <laughs> I think we talked about this in, in uh, your episode on Chasing Leviathan, but um, poor Mondays are like feel such of the brunt of like yeah. like all right it's time to be disciplined but i'm just mm -hmm. like okay i'm just gonna like completely relax saturday through sunday i'm gonna try and eat cleanly but just like completely just like let myself rest and then monday i'm gonna start my habits back over because i'm just more productive even mm -hmm. when i'm doing not, not that i'm doing it when even when i'm doing more stuff that isn't work i'm more productive because i'm in a better place yeah. and that's like i mean even like uh so this last with this custom coding project i hadn't done anything like that in a long time so we were up till this is the busiest we've been in our three years as a business and we were up till three in the morning like for most of a week and it was insane like you haven't had anything like that in a long time and i was just so tired <laughs> you know i'm mean? like and I, I was just like and i'm like man i can't figure out how to fix this coding problem and i'm like probably because you're tired like, <laughs> like it's and i'm really, like okay i, I need I to go for a walk yeah it's it's good to take a break i'm learning like uh as i said at the beginning we we're back from our hiatus the reason i had to take a hiatus and it was it was um as i say in like the announcement um little snippet uh, that I put up in the podcast feed. Uh, it was kind of sudden, but it was needed because I was starting to um, just kind of sacrifice some bits that I didn't, uh, that I knew that I didn't want to sacrifice. And yeah. that is already after I've sacrificed sleep and diet. I've like, let's not even, I haven't figured it out yet. Let's just, it's, <laughs> it's a factor that I'll think about one day, but it literally happened because I think I was burning myself out. And then also just becoming really confused. Cause I was like, I'm really enjoying this creative thing. And I actually, I don't know if you, you felt the same. Cause obviously you've had, uh, you wanted to do like teaching and you kind of were like, these are my potential paths. And then this mm -hmm. kind of new one presented itself kind of seemingly from the past. Um, I don't know. Um, like, did it feel at any point once you decided or like, actually, even you said that um, the freelance uh, sort of company came about um, almost like suddenly. 
accidentally. Yes. Yeah. It was like, was there any, because I'm, this is what I'm expecting for me. I'm expecting one day, like I'm doing something and then it's kind of like one of those movie montage epiphanies where it's like, oh my God, this is it. And I like run down the street back to Alex and no. I'm like, honey, no, I figured no. it out. No. You're saying no? It's, I, We've I, had this discussion I, I, I so much. I hate to break it to you, but those film montages are not real. They are real for some they're, people. I would say they're very rare. So this is this is this is super weird. I I literally fell in love at first sight, and I didn't believe in it, and I didn't believe that like I still don't I think believe in it, but I did it. I, I still that's don't exactly. It. <laughs> I was like, it's total, I, it's total garbage, but I, I did it. Yeah, I remember the exact <laughs> moment Nancy walked through the door through the, into the room that I was in, and. Uh, like the the rest of the room just sort of just like just turns into like this haze this like vignette i can't see and, it, yeah. and i told I st- him no it's not love at first sight it was it was but you just said look this no. is being recorded yeah i know it's being I've recorded got- so it's fine <laughs> but it's, uh, you, look you know it's like pj was a test you know what is truth uh, it's a, wow you know it's a, it's a it's a whole philosophical thing look I, as someone that studied history there's a lot of truth in a lot of places <laughs> Um, and the truth is, I saw you, and I remember that. Now, whether Thanks. that's love at first sight, you don't remember seeing me. I so was it's hungover. Like, <laughs> you know, it's well. Okay, that you know, in your defense, yeah. No, I literally, when I saw Becky Sue, I'm like, that's the girl I'm going to marry. Mm. Like that was like super, super strange. And I actually didn't really. I like tried to get to know her, like, and because I didn't know who she was, and I was like, no. And so, like, I tried to get to know her in normal ways, but my <laughs> wife. Uh, loves to work. She works really hard, and so even in college, she had two jobs. Wow! And so she would, yeah, she she w- she'd get up at four thirty in the morning to go do the work at the bakery. Then she'd go to class, and then she would work in the afternoon, and then she'd go to the library and study, and go to bed at eight. So the idea of me, like I like would like try to, you know, I'm like, oh, I, maybe I'll see her around campus or whatever. No, like <laughs> she was just never around. That's what started and, your bread addiction. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she makes uh, she makes scones every Sunday, and it raspberry scones especially. But she makes it. Oh, okay, so uh, it's amazing. I'm inviting myself over. I'm getting the next flight. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> you, guys, you guys are coming over for scones, and then I like mean, the which most is, expensive scones ever. <laughs> they'll be worth it. I want to see. It's uh, just. People who work that hard and don't uh, like, I don't know whether she would say that that was difficult, but there's some people that have re- was just like, yeah, that's what I had to do. I, that's what I like to do. I had money in my bank account. I really liked it. And I'm like, but what about sleep and video games and friends and fun? <laughs> These are the demons that will hold you back. <laughs> Those are the little things with the eyes, with the knife behind the cute little eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. you're looking at a you're looking at like a, a can of rum and coke and it's like got big eyes on it going please drink me is that like is that where we're at <laughs> i'm good for you <laughs> okay, all right but but anyway, yeah i don't know yeah. if, uh, if you felt like because of this like love at first sight potential i hope to have love at or no realization you, you hope to have love wow no, no, no. thanks <laughs> I heard you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Complete my sentences at your own discretion, but do not blame me for the results, for they are not my own. Um, anyway, what I was going to say is I'm hoping to have realization at eventual thinking about my career, maybe. <laughs> well, you, uh, so this is how it worked for me. I mean, part of the reason uh, I was like, okay, uh, I started doing the programming thing just to pay for my. Uh, stuff from my family. The easiest thing to get into is web development because it's changing all the time, but that also means you have to keep up with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, um, and then uh, the easiest thing to get in at a low level is digital marketing. Mm-hmm. So, and that's kind of, and then I was like, you know what? That'll work great for everything I want to do for a writing perspective, even as like a speaker or slash teacher. I mean, uh, so I'll, I'll give this proviso right off the bat. If you want an example of what to do with your podcast, don't start with mine because I, I brought on two other guys and I'm teaching them, mm. but they're not, they're both working very part time. So 
<laughs> so we're taking the teaching process really slow. So that's not like a, this is a how to. It's like, no, we're fixing like one thing each week. I'm like, all right, this week we're going to focus on this. Mm-hmm. And they, so this is um, a how to kind of. <laughs> yes. If you if you notice what we change each week, it'd be a great like. <laughs> but uh, and I don't honestly, I'm still learning about podcasts like uh, everything's slightly different. But uh, websites are something that I mean, we get paid a good amount of money to do. Um, and I just realized that as I was doing, it, I was like, this will work great. Like everyone needs a website. Uh, not everybody. Most people need a website. Uh, uh, when you talk about creatives, uh, it's really helpful. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the, when you, you like, you want to know where candid goat came from. I started by writing a blog when I was in, uh, graduate school Oh my! and I called it candid yeah. goat. Go ahead. The amount of like businesses and wonderful things that have started because of blogs. Like it's really, uh, I was reading uh, Atomic Habits and that started with a blog. Uh, it's a book by James Clear. And um, I have read the first chapter. I don't know what that I says too, about my habits, but. <laughs> I too have read the first chapter. Which <laughs> I bought it on Amazon like a month ago. And today on the bus, I was like, oh, I have extra time because it's raining and I'm on the bus so I can read instead of walking into trees like I sometimes do when I don't pay attention on my commute and I'm walking. Um, so let I'm me glad down- I'm not the only one. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So I downloaded the sample of the book and I was like, oh, this is interesting. So you downloaded the sample of the book that you own that's been sat in our bedroom for two months. Yes. Excellent. That okay. is correct. <laughs> However, the takeaway is that started as a blog. <laughs> <laughs> And okay, I I can't I can't even begin to judge you because I know I have the DVD. <laughs> oh my no, brother please do it. It's really easy. No, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my brother wanted to watch uh, Fistful of Dollars. He'd never seen it before. The Clint Eastwood <gasps> Such a good film. film. Mm. I love that series. So that like Good, Bad, and the Ugly, one of my all time favorites. Fistful of Dollars is way up there. Mm. And I had the DVD DVD somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> and I was like, I could go look for it, or I could just buy it. And then I'll always know where it is. And so I bought it and I'm like, this is so lazy. I can't even like, well, this is, like, I, so you ooh, got your sample I, for I, free. I, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt there. So two things. First of all, I did the exact same thing, but with <laughs> the alien quadrilogy um, and uh, shameless plug. Uh, I am currently writing a screenplay for a Western. Ooh, ooh yeah. nice. Oh so, uh, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, Karen. So, <laughs> I, I know, but I lo- yeah. Um, and I, 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 yeah, those kind of genres are so classic. Uh, the novel I'm writing currently is a noir. I mean, it's urban fantasy. So, I mean, basically, I, I, I read noir and I was like, I'm not sure if I can write better than these guys. These guys are really good. You know, I'm reading like Raymond Chandler, that kind of thing. You're that's like, so good though. Like, you can't compare yourself to someone that's like clearly just <laughs> naturally born with it. <laughs> well, not trying to. Well, okay. So that's, we could talk about that, but that's interesting. Do you know when he wrote The Long Goodbye? Uh, that was his last one, wasn't it? One of his last ones? Yeah. It's what, it's, it's my, my favorite. One of his best is he was 72. So wow. to say, yeah, to say oh like, God, I've still got time. Okay. Right. Yeah. I know. <laughs> like I, when I found that out, I was like, oh, I just need to make sure that I just, if I just write a little bit every day, I can, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever be better than Raymond Chandler. I mean, if I could be as good as Raymond Chandler, that'd be great. You know what I mean? But who knows how good I could be if I wrote every day for 40 years, because mm. I still have 40 years before I'm there. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. a long time. That's a, that is a true film montage then you come out like a dedicated swordsman on the other side. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we talk about this on on this podcast with almost every creator because everyone yeah. has this sort of uh, like fight with w- what like their daily practice. Or some people don't, but yeah. I I certainly do. Um, and it's kind of like uh, one of the one of my favorite things. And I don't know whether he was quoting somebody else, but. Uh, Nico from Corridor Crew, which is like a a VFX uh, channel uh, on YouTube, talks about how you can never make something that looks as good without the hours and hours of practice and sort of like getting all the really bad stuff out of the way to get to your good stuff because it's in you. You just have to get all the bad stuff out of the way and you can't do that unless you make it, Um, which is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. (sighs) But also... (laughs) um, to kind of add to the point of like, you guys are both uh, writers and, and you're like, I'm always, I think writers to me are like 
like a whole different kind of creative in some ways because you can do it so quietly but at the same time like it when you mm -hmm. finally bring something out it has so much impact but one thing that i always say is uh, to to alex to hopefully encourage him is um that like you're not the going to be the best judge of your own work and you have to yeah. like let people judge for themselves to see if they think it's good because obviously you guys think that um certain writers might be good but what if like somebody else is like nah it's terrible well, i suppose it's like um it de depends on who you heard first as a writer mm. who published that work and what you end up believing as a result mm. it's like uh with uh john steinbeck he's so very famous for grapes of wrath and um the oh god the title suddenly eluded the me. pearl the pearl yeah and um i read that when i was 10 years old because it was short i had been, <laughs> do you know how that book ends it, it's not it's not really going to go translate well into like a sort of daytime film. Um. <laughs> no, no. I, I was 10 years old. I think it was the first book I ever read with a sad ending. And it's a very sad ending. And, you know, I don't want to give spoilers, though. It is kind of an older book. But it was just like I was sitting there. And I was like 10 years old. And I was like, people can write about this. This is OK. Like, I mean, you know, Of Mice and Men is like, yeah, that's the it's one. not I a happy like, ending either. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. So, um, but of Mice and Men things. Uh, so he he's well known for the other ones, but his own favorite one that he did was East of Eden. And that's not what the audience considers to be his best work. Hello, it's me, Nancy Art Music, interrupting this podcast episode, which I hope you are enjoying, to let you know that this month I'll be doing Inktober every single day at 7 a.m. Monday to Friday BST, that's British Summertime, and on weekends at 10 a.m. British Summertime, and this is going to to be an online event uh, where you can buy tickets for £2.50 or the equivalent of about $3 to essentially help each other hold each other accountable for this art challenge, which defeats me every year since its inception. And so it would be nice to finish it one day, uh, which is, I'm hoping, what you guys will, will like to do as well. And if this is something you're interested in, Link is in the show notes where you can click through to the Eventbrite page and buy a ticket. It is one Zoom link, one password, so if you pay once, you can join in as long as you know what time the meeting starts. And yeah, it's going to be fun. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Um, but we, uh, I remember when uh, I, all those days ago, when um, we recorded the episode um, on Chasing Leviathan, uh, you briefly mentioned that you had uh, a book that you wrote originally, which kind of came about somehow. And um, can you talk a bit about that, how your first book came about? The one that, that's never going to see the light of day. Um, oh, you want the one that's never going to see the light of day? Yeah, because that's the one I'm curious about. Of course, <laughs> oh, being, no. the, being the flawed workshop, like mm. th this whole thing, this whole podcast came about from me realizing that I have like a paralyzing perfectionist issue with music that I'm trying to get over. So it, in some ways, this is kind of like my journey to interview my way out of or into doing music, I guess. Um, but so I want to know about all the the things that people have kind of like left behind slash abandoned slash decided for the better that it wasn't worth doing. Sure. Um, so to understand, I think the fundamental idea was good and I think I might write it again someday, but I would literally just write it again mm -hmm. because I fell into the trap and I, this is understandable, right? I was struggling with the idea of self-discipline. I took a summer off and I did. And I was like, all I have to do is just write this many words in a day. Mm -hmm. And I just tried to write those words a day and I did, I finished it. And I actually like, that was good because it forced me to write and it helped me solve this particular problem, which was I would write what was ever on my mind that day. Mm -hmm. Not like, not like a journal, but like, uh, I, this character started just becoming me in mm -hmm. uninteresting ways because like, at the time, I was getting a lot of Frappuccinos. And so this character started getting Frappuccinos, which didn't fit the character at all. And I'm just like, really, like, and this is just me mentioning, like, really, like, I had just started listening to punk music. So this guy liked punk music. And it didn't really fit the character at all. And, like, basically, the character was just me. And it didn't fit the character conflict. Mm -hmm. So what basically, I was 
18 at the time and I was just writing this and it wasn't because like as soon as I read went back and actually read what I had been reading or writing uh I immediately identified the problem the thing and I and so I don't mind that this happened um and I wouldn't mind writing the story again because I think the fundamental story was pretty good uh a little bit anime uh shonen esque if i can yes. use like it's like it's like like you know, the power up like you know like okay like it's like wow he's like indestructible or whatever but um he's the, half punch man <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> oh another like big dilemma that i think we talk about quite a lot is consuming content to inform your own work and right. kind of like uh, obviously for for me personally like discipline is a big uh, sort of thing that I, I want to develop more of. I think I have some of it sometimes. It's making sure I have more of it enough most of, it. of the time. Enough of it always, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think and more- it's some that you have to come to terms with who you are. Yeah. Like um, I, I, growing up in fundamentalist Christianity, the models I were I was set were like, well, you know, Calvin woke up at four in the morning and Martin Luther woke up at four in the morning to pray. So if you're not doing that, you're not doing enough. And I would literally like, talk, I'm like, <laughs> You and then I, and show them how to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. It's like I think they were trying to be inspiring, and instead, it was just like. And for some personalities, it worked, right? Some people be like, "Oh, that's really cool." I mean, I'm not going to get up at four, but that's cool. <laughs> and like for me, I was like, "Well, apparently, I'm supposed to be getting up at four. I'm I'm not a good Christian." And I'm like, and then like I'm in college, and uh, dear professor, great mentor, and we're we're sitting there, we're talking about. It. He's like, "Well, yeah, they went to bed when the sun went down." Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's not that impressive. It's like yeah, it's like like they still slept like seven to eight hours and then they got up to pray. It's like <laughs> like That's just their morning. You know, somehow that got yeah. How how did that like it, it's it's really interesting how we take things from other people's lives and we don't put it into a perspective. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you know, everyone talks about like this is uh I remember reading a blog article about this is what writers do every day, you know, and they gave and it was actually kind of cool. Because it was, it gave different routines of all published authors, mm-hmm. mm. and I was like, "Oh, this is super helpful to see how they're all different." And they're trying to help you by showing everyone has something different. But the thing about all of them is, they're all published authors making money. Yeah, from <laughs> that was, was literally like, the point I was going to say after that. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I was like sitting there. I'm like, well. I have a job and I'm homeschooling and I'm running a podcast. I'm like, okay. Like when I have been most successful is when I've set it down to like, I'm like, I I have to have a word count or otherwise I I'll start thinking about something else because mm-hmm. I just get, you know, um, you know, that's like, I mean, when I talk about that, that first novel being cringy, it'd just be like a good 50% of it was just like, and you know, the problem with this is, and then I just have like this monologue, like yeah. just off, you know, like I'm 18, I'm stupid. Like, I'm 18, and, I'm angry, and I need the world to know. <laughs> yes, yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, exactly. Like, when you talk about, uh, you have to find some like, and, you know, you're talking about discipline. If you can do something, like, find something that works for you, let it develop, and it's much better to write, and this is what I found, um, it's better to write 300 words a day than it is to write a thousand words a day. Mm-hmm. So when I got a lot done in the urban fantasy novel I'm working on now, which is a noir um, with a uh, elf who's magically disabled working as a PI. Um, I love but... this idea so much. <laughs> I'm on board. <laughs> <laughs> and it's set in central Florida. So you get like all like the really weird Florida man type vibes too. Like it. not from him, but it. yes. Um, and the whole thing was just bath salts. <laughs> <laughs> the the very uh, lucrative trade in bath salts. No. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but that started with 300 words a day. That was when uh, we were fostering this uh, infant, which, you know, that's a thing, you know. Um, <laughs> Sounds like uh, a lot of work. Yes. Yeah. Kids are, you know, especially if like I was staying up with them six nights a week, like mm-hmm. through the night. So I'd get like, yeah, sleep was not the, was not my priority. Like literally running kept me sane. You know what I mean? It was just like, but, uh, and then I did try to do 2000 words. Cause I was doing one of those like November, I did one of those nano remo things where you like, write Like to, yeah. and I did that. And then I was like, this isn't working for me mm-hmm. because I'm burning out. 
Mm-hmm. And then I switch to a thousand words. And if I have a low work schedule, a thousand words a day is pretty good. I mm-hmm. honestly, even if I was writing full time, I don't know how much more I could do than that. Just because of the way, like there's a certain part of me, like a re- reservoir that only works like a thousand words a day. But if I have a lot going on, I'm like, I just need to be content with two to 300 words. And what I found is, um, the, you see, I saw more improvement in my actual writing, uh, doing 300 words a day, every day, because the thing about writing 2000 words is you have the same quality from that day. But if you write 300 and then you think about it the next day and you're like, you have all the other, the breaks in between, then like your next 300 words is like marginally better. <laughs> Yes. Whereas it's like marginally better of 2,000 words, which is like, like now I have 2,000 words of crap. I'm going to have to <laughs> edit that out. So, um, and so it's just a, it's a, like, but you can also run out of steam with your characters, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that's something that Stephen King mentions. Um, I do think Stephen King is a good and bad resource for writing advice because it's very clear that he has succeeded and I want to be careful how I say this. I, uh, he obviously has some natural talent, but he doesn't have as much natural talent as some other writers. Like I've read some real clunkers from Stephen King. The mm-hmm. man has succeeded through volume. Like yeah. <laughs> I've read some of his books. They're fantastic. And I've read some of his books. And I'm like, I, if, if this had been the first book I'd read by him, I would have been like, why, why is he oh. so famous? You know? Yeah. And, it's quite nice to have other people sometimes like be like, yeah, the, these are the, the better ones. It's like, yeah, every, every now and then you get you get sort of one author that has just one notable piece of work. Um, so J.D. Salinger, yeah. like he had a couple, yes. a couple of other um, short stories and things, but it, it was one novel. Uh, Harper Lee, one novel, and it's like the it's still one of the best selling books of all time. Uh, I know she then had the sequel that was published after her death, but that was that she know. didn't want. She yeah. did not want published. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, but so mean but it's um it's, it's the fact that when you have these uh comparing that to the song like Stephen king as you're saying it's it's volume um like one of my favorite writers growing up was rl stein who did all the goosebumps books and things yes and uh, i watched an interview with him and someone said um uh how do you seem to be pumping out a book every single week and he goes hey 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 it's every two weeks uh, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> and uh, he, he basically really said, he's like, I, I, have, I have found a structure that works. A lot of my books, yeah. not all of them, but, you know, probably half of them have the same structure. It's just the characters, the settings, and the, uh, the reward is different. Yeah. Um, and for the audience he was writing for, which was, you know, me as a young, you know, as a young kid and then as a teenager right. and stuff, it, it nailed it. And then he does, you know, he he then went off and did other things like Fear Street or whatever, where it was, you know, a completely different thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. When you so when you say comparing people to Stephen King and stuff, it's like yeah, that is that is like a massive anomaly in mm-hmm. the in, in the midst of it. Like again, you know. Also, his books are thick and the font is tiny. How does this? Ha- I don't understand it. Also, <laughs> you can tell I'm not a book reader. <laughs> well, and so here's the interesting thing. I mean. Even and I've just started to experience this, and it's been interesting to watch it in real time. Uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Haruki Murakami. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote uh, Hard Boiled Wonderland, The End of the World, uh, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. So um, it, there was a list that some literary magazine did where they asked 250 like best selling authors to come up with their 10 favorite books, and then it rated them all according to and like Wind Up Bird Chronicle was like in the top 50. Um, so bad. <laughs> so it's really good. It, I I love that book. Very intense. I'm just gonna like very uh, adult in its content. Um, it's his way of dealing with the atrocities that Japan committed in the war. Oh, um, so, so a light and, read then. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's like 700 pages too. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's interesting oh, is a lot yeah. of atrocities. It's a, it's a- <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and it, it, he talks about the Russian atrocities back and the way it's it's very mm. interesting because he actually he so he writes magical realism. So the way he deals with it is very um just different. You know, like when you th- it, like he a lot of people compare him to Kafka. He uses a lot of Kafka type imagery. So it's like, okay. you know, like uh I think in one of his books, a different book, literally there this um old man's walking with an umbrella and these thugs try to uh, attack him or make fun of him just because he's old and he's on their turf. 
and then a, a, a storm of leeches fall out of the sky and devour them. But he's protected by his umbrella. And they, he never explains how that happens. Um, you know, it's like, it's very Kafka esque. Like, Kafka. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, I've like, woken up as a cockroach. Is... Okay, then. <laughs> yeah. That now what do we do? Bothered me. I like yeah. <laughs> a couple of books. That, like, I I enjoyed having to do reading as a challenge for homework, so that I could. I don't know. I really liked my English teacher, and so like I wanted to be one of the impressive students. So I read the books, and I was so confused. Um, yeah. Metamorphosis and Lord of the Flies were two of the sort of bits of literature that I was just really they created feelings in me that I don't understand. Like, I don't understand why I was so upset. I love um, Lord I, of the Flies. I see, I That's love one of my favorite. She I hate it. Hates it with a passion. <laughs> I don't understand it, okay? Piggy. I don't believe it. I don't, that's what it is. I don't believe it. <clears throat> I uh, refuse. I refuse to believe it. It's not true. Um, well, it's obviously very true because a British frigate turns up at the end and saves everyone. So Saves everyone? Yeah. Saves everyone. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. exactly. Everyone who's left. Yeah. Everyone who's left. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> you know? And, and so it, very upset. Look, the most believable thing about it is the fact that a random British naval vessel then turns up to an uninhabited island. I just. Like, yes. <laughs> I just, wonderful. Yeah. The, like the, I remember that day so clearly because I was confused. And I remember turning that last page back and forth because I was like, no. I don't understand this. There has to be something <laughs> else. The, yeah, where was the redemption? And, yeah. They, they woke up oh, and it was Do not dream. read The Pearl by John Steinbeck. Do not read it. <laughs> the way you described it, I was like, this feels like it's going to be like, I'm glad that I didn't read it, it as assigned reading. I have, yeah. Of Mice and Men was actually upsetting enough. Like, oh, just, I haven't read. Honestly, that was enough for me. I didn't read any more Steinbeck. Like, I literally found Steinbeck's uh, The Pearl to be more like to be sadder than Lord of the Flies. Like it was like, oh man. Oh yeah, Anyways. definitely. Yeah. I will not read yeah. it. <laughs> um, so, I did want to return to the Haruki Murakami point because I did have a point with that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's fine. Like I just wanted, like, because we were talking about the, um, how some people seem to have a lot of natural talent. Mm-hmm. So Haruki Murakami's story, he's been the law, um, odds favorite to win the Nobel Prize like three or four times. Um, so like, uh, he's an international bestseller. Like he was the last person since J.K. Rowling to have a midnight uh, release um, for his book, where people were lined up out of the outside bookstores, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you look at this, like obviously uh, he had never written a book till he was twenty nine, and then he sat down, he wrote a book, and he sent the only copy he had to a competition. And it won the competition. Oh, my God. (laughs) So he had been a bartender for 10 years, like running his own bar, or maybe it was six or seven. So he knew how to talk, and he wrote in the first person. And he obviously had a very vivid imagination. Uh, What's interesting about that, because I looked at that, and I was like, well, I guess some people just have an incredible amount of God-given natural talent. Like, you look at Stephen King, you're like, this man has obviously persevered through hard work. Like, you look at one of his interviews, and, like, they were talking to him, and he's like, they're like, how often do you write? He's like, I write every day except for Christmas. And someone's after, like, and there was a later interview, and someone was like, uh, really? Every day except for Christmas? He's like, no, I lied. They're like, uh, he's like, I write on Christmas, too. I just felt weird saying that. (laughs) <laughs> um that's like like he obviously loves writing and he obviously is not as talented as some other people he's like a great example of like <laughs> my man has stuck with it like that's yeah. he loves it he just does it he's written some stinkers he's written some amazing stuff mm-hmm. like if i had written as much as he had i would have some bestsellers too i'm sure like mm-hmm. that you if you wrote like i think he writes like four to five thousand words a day yeah like and he's been Wait. doing that for like 50 years that's insane but also unfortunately sometimes you can tell that he writes four to five thousand words oh that's what i'm saying yeah like he he has he has gone the full like i'm gonna write some stinkers i'm gonna like i am like gonna find the gems as i come across them Mm -hmm. um where murakami he writes uh wins an award in his first book uh writes a couple others uh hard boy wonderland and the end of the world one of my favorites uh, does well, and then he writes Wind Up Bird Chronicle, and it's like universally acclaimed. All these other authors are like this is amazing, and he keeps writing, and they do okay. One of them, the next one, like, it was one that was like had that midnight selling. 
And people are like, it's not as good. Mm. And then he just did, he just released one and it's like, and I read it and I was like, this is not good. And Aww. one of the things is I think the translation wasn't as good. So I think that's not entirely his fault because mm-hmm. um, he's writing in Japanese, right? That's part of it. But part of it is he is, he has a very distinct formula. You know, mm-hmm. we're talking about the R.L. Stein thing. He writes in first person, magic realism. And it's really stunning to read for the first time. And he has an obvious story to tell. But he uses a lot of the same symbols book to book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's very clear that in a lot of ways, what's working for him and that natural talent, I don't even think it's so much natural talent as like he found a very clear and easy way to depict what was going on in his brain. And it was very convincing, very articulate, and it it resonated with a lot of people. Mm. And then he used it to explain about this very big issue, Uh, you know, like this whole like how is uh, Japanese culture dealing with itself as it like it becomes westernized but they lost in the war to the West, but they also like are kind of coming to terms with like, we were the bad guys, but we also got bombed. And like, you know, like that's like, that's like a lot of tensions there. Like it makes for good reading um, and more than that. Right. Like, I mean, there's an important cultural dialogue going on there. Um, but you just start to realize like he, because he's never written and I, it makes me think of, and I, it's easy to look at Hemingway and say, he's just too harsh. But Hemingway said, anybody can write a novel in the first person. And <laughs> which is really mean, but it's like, it's mu- and I've discovered that it's much easier to write in the first person than to write in third person. I generally oh. find. Well, and yeah, I, I find that like when, when I used to write like little short stories, mostly again for school and creative writing projects, uh, like I would always prefer to write in first person. It's really hard to describe. I think if you're, you're writing on behalf, it almost feels like you're doing it on behalf of the people that you're in the room. And so whose perspective do you focus on? And like, why is the story being told? You have to justify all these things. Whereas it's if technically writing, more difficult. Yeah. Sorry, I'll go ahead. Yeah. No, but yeah, that's exactly it. It's is that you have to like prioritize all these things and justify why it's being told from that perspective and whose story, like, what is the story about? And that's, you know, it's, it, it's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's cool. And that, I mean, that's why, obviously, that's one of those things that you see in Alex. You're just like, oh, my gosh, he can do it. But um, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, so um, but uh, my point is, is that even like you look at these people who are true, like natural God given talent, like, holy crap, this person's like amazing, like mm. just out of the gate. And then sometimes that ends up being a weakness in some ways. And in fact, it almost always does in one way or another. Um, you have to look at what, um, where you are and where you want to go and then find sometimes that path will take longer than you think. And mm-hmm. I, I talked about this last time. It just, it seems, you know, uh, but I have been struck by and really appreciated Bill Gates quote. Uh, Most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10. Yeah. yeah. I love and, that quote as well. It, mm-hmm. it just, it's so, it's just, if if you just pick, like, I think a lot of people always think about 10 years in the future, but if you think back to 10 years in the past, where you were 10 years ago versus where you are now, if you've always tried to better yourself in one way or another, even if you think you've failed, in a lot of ways, the, you've quite likely moved forward if you persevered through all that. But um, what you were saying also about, like, finding your own technique and and like like look comparing regular kind of creative or like regular creative people who have nine to fives and families and you know spouses and things like that comparing that to professionals who are giving this advice from their perspective is another reason why this podcast exists because I love looking at people's like daily routines on YouTube and it all is so romanticized and beautifully cut and edited and there's music and it's great, (laughs) but they're like, you know, this is what led me to success. And it will be people that are just like doing slightly better than you feel like you're doing that Mm. are confident enough to be able to tell you that this is how I made it. Thank you for listening to the podcast so far. If you'd like to follow PJ on all his social media and find his podcast, the links will be in the description below. 
If you want to stick around and listen to the next episode, which is the sort of bonus episode to this one, we will be discussing SEO, which is search engine optimization, digital marketing, and basically the best ways to get your content, whether it's art or music or podcasts or anything else, in front of as many people online as possible. So if you're interested in that, stick around and yeah, stay tuned. I have been Nancy Art Music. You can follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Nancy Art Music. Alex, where can we find you? I'm Alex Roberts, and you can find me on Instagram at Alex Roberts Writer. Yeah. And you can find my first collection of poetry, Empire, on Amazon. 